Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to Deep Water Wednesday. We are going to get into some deep water, too, so I'm glad you all joined us. And um, I, I'm going to start. Betty's going to be rename herself Roxella. And there she is. I'm going to have her hair white before long. And uh, <laughs> we're going to. We're going to give you some prophecies. No, no, no. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the word tonight and finding Jesus. We're going to be in Genesis chapter three. And as we get started, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, just we got a couple people to pray for. Larry, um, Eileen's husband, he is still recovering from back surgery. Uh, I can tell you it, it takes a while to come out, out of the ether. So let's pray for him. And uh, continue to pray that we have favor with our insurance company and all the things working there. We, we are getting some things going forward. And um, I, I think by the time we get back to church, we're going to just have a pretty, pretty good outside looking uh, with new roofs and stuff. So, uh, and a brand new music room back there. So praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, we just want to thank you and praise you and lift you up and give you glory and honor for Jesus, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. We just thank you, Father God, that he has given us salvation and that we have health and wholeness and healing, that the members of Messiah Community Church, are they are wrapped around with your love and your protection keeps them. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that they are prospering. Even in the midst of any economic turndown, they are prospering and you are providing for them because all the silver is yours, all the gold is yours. And Father, you lay out a perfect plan for your people. And we thank you and praise you for it. Father, open our ears and our eyes tonight. Give us wisdom and understanding of your word. Father, we pray for Larry uh, right now, Father God, Larry Thorpe, in the name of the Lord Jesus, his healing will be swift. It'll be powerful, Lord God. He will feel better than he's ever felt in a very long time. And we thank you, Father God, for the blessing that's on his life. We just give you praise and glory for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you that we have favor with God and man, and we have favor with our insurance company. Lord God, we're going to have just an abundant outflow to fix our building. And we thank you for it, Father that we might give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get started. We're going to be in uh, Exodus. This is part 17 of Jesus in the Old Testament. And uh, I believe we are going to have a really good, good lesson. Get your thinking caps on tonight. We're going to start at Exodus chapter 3, verse number 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go? to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. You know, I think most of us ask the same question a lot of times. Who am I that I should go? The enemy has used this method to discourage so many believers from going and doing. In our heads, we've been conditioned to not believe we have anything of value to be used by God. The doubt may come in many colored packages. They think I'm judging them. You know, what, what, what are they going to think? Uh, you know, if I say something, they might think I'm judging them. If I do this or that, they, I mean, who am I to go? Because he, Moses is being called for a specific purpose here. That's a, uh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he's going to have a tough thing. Pharaoh now is the, uh, he is a type and shadow of, the ruler of this world, influencing those who are under his authority. So whatever Pharaoh says, Egypt's going to do. And so here's Moses, and Moses is having that. He's, he's doubting in his head. Hey, I'm just not that kind of person, or I'm sh shy, and so on and so forth. He's going to be uh, in a sticky situation here with God because, it, in fact, it says, God's anger was kindled against Moses when he keeps asking these questions. And I think so many of us, in, especially today, we say, who am I? Who am I? I mean, I, I'm just nobody. Or, you know, I can't really do this, or I can't really do that. When the truth is, 
if you're going to go do something, and God is going to ask you to go do something, you feel in your heart, you feel compelled. And I get asked all the time by people, well, I just want to go where God wants me to be. And I just don't know what that is. I'm praying that he would show me. And my, my response is always the same. It's, what do you like to do? What are you comfortable doing? What's your heart really feel led to? What natural abilities and talents do you have to go do what you do? I mean, if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, you know, if you can't uh, hold a note to save your life, you're probably not called into the singing ministry and you're probably not going to be comfortable going there. You know, if I, if I said, hey, we've got a nursing home that opened up. We want to go and do church services for them. And I need some singers. Well, if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, you're not going to go, oh, it's just what my heart's always desired to do. You know, or, or yeah, good one, Richard, uh, or drive a nail, not a carpenter. Exactly. If you can't do it, don't do it because you're not equipped for it. God equips people to do what he's called them to do. He will always, the equipping will come before the call. And for somebody to say, I just don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, it, it it's not that. You just haven't learned how to see it. Moses really did not think he was equipped to do this, but he God knew he was exactly equipped. In fact, when he goes to talk to Pharaoh, even though God told him, hey, tell Aaron what to do. I'll put it in your mouth. You put it in Aaron's mouth. Type and shadow of Jesus, put it into his disciples' mouths, right? Talked about that a little bit last week. When, it, when he says that, <clears throat> really the fact is Moses did almost all the talking. Fair, I mean, Aaron didn't hardly do any talking. Moses was doing all the talking. Here's the guy who said, I'm not equipped to do this. And he guess what? He's equipped. When he, when he answers the call, he is equipped because God designed him that way. So we want to start right there. And because the whole lesson tonight is about go tell Pharaoh. Go tell the world. Go tell the ruler of this world who you are in Christ Jesus and what you are designed to do and what you are de designed to go forth with for, for the glory of God. Go tell, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Go tell people that I'm going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the world. Now, there's some equipment we're going to need here. Gen or Exodus 3, 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, what mountain is this that they should serve God on? What mountain is it? Anybody remember the name of the mountain? All right, let me take you through it here. Josephus tells us this mountain was considered holy by the shepherds of the region. They would not allow their flocks to even graze there because they were afraid. They, the, the locals were afraid. Yeah, Mount Horeb. This is indeed Mount Sinai where Moses ends up receiving the law and meeting with God. So Moses starts out on Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai. Um, at first, listen, he doesn't understand the local culture. He's an Egyptian. In all, in all ways, he's an Egyptian. And so he comes and he takes his sheep to this mountain that the shepherds won't go to. But obviously Moses sees it and he sees, hey, there's vegetation there. I can take my sheep up there. There's some good grazing ground up on that mountain. So he takes them up there. He doesn't understand or chooses to ignore the legends of the mountain where God meets the earth. Because that was the local, kind of the local legend. Don't go there. That's where God meets and, and he comes down on that mountain. Who knows why they believe that? They just did. And the, the custom and the culture of the time is kind of unsure. It's kind of a little mythical, you know, and, and nobody really knows. But Moses either chose to ignore it or he just didn't understand and just walked into it. Either way, he gets there. It's the mountain that he's going to, God says, this is where you're going to serve me. Horeb literally means desolate. But Sinai has no certain derivation or meaning. 
Its Hebrew spelling, though, does tell us something about this mysterious mountain where God chooses to meet with Moses twice. Now, understand that. God meets with Moses twice on Sinai. Once on Mount Horeb, which is one side, once on Mount Sinai, which is the other side of the same exact mountain. Once there, here, where Moses unwittingly comes, and once later when God calls him to the mountain for 40 days. Now, the name of this mountain is Samach Yud Nun Yud. Sinai. Sinek, Samek, Yud, Nun, Yud. Literally, this spells out Samek. Turn aside or support. Yud, work or deed. Nun, offspring, life or heir to the throne. And then another Yud, which is work or deed. So we can see that the letters give us turn aside from work is the heir to the throne, or the offspring, the deed. So turn aside from work, that's what Sinai means, turn aside from work, the heir to the throne, or the offspring, that's their deed. Their deed is to turn aside from the work. That's what Sinai means. Horeb means desolate. Sorry, Mike, you might need to turn off and come back on. So Sinai means desolate, which is what the local people saw. The people that Moses is encamped with, his father-in-law. They're looking and they're saying, oh, that's Mount Horeb, desolate. That's desolate. We don't want to go up there because that's where God is. And, and everything's desolate there. Life doesn't live there. On the other side, God calls him to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the, the heir to the throne or the offspring, this is where he's going to turn aside from work. And he's going to have his deed is to meet with God. That's what his work is to meet with God. That's what Moses went up on the mountain to do was meet with God. He didn't get up to go up there to meet, get 10 commandments. He went up there to meet with God. It was the children of Israel that demanded the commandments. It was the children of Israel that said, Tell us what we'll do. We'll get to that in another week. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord, of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, we're going to come back to these verses in a minute, but I want you to see these up front. And notice the of in all of these. In the name of the Lord Jesus. This is going to become very important in your understanding. Whereas the people of the region saw this desolate place where God came to the earth, Moses was told to meet him where Israel was to turn aside from the works and become heirs to the throne or the offspring of God, which was their deeds. Romans 4.14 tells us that we're heirs, heirs according to the faith. Galatians 3.29 tells us that we're Abraham's seed and heirs. So we have a special place in which we're gonna, we have to know the meaning of, of the name of the Lord God that we serve. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18 says this, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Through Christ we become heirs, thus released from the works to gain his favor. That's what Moses going up to Mount Sinai was all about. He was going up so that we would become heirs, so that children of Israel would be heirs to the favor of God. Jesus Christ, he became our sacrifice and went into the heavens so that we would become heirs 
It's ours through promise received by faith alone. This is why God called Moses to Sinai, so that we quit working. We'd stop working, and we'd begin to believe by faith. Now, take a look here at Exodus 3, 14 through 15, because this is the next step of this. And Moses said to God, I am who I am. Moses is saying, who are you? Yeah, it's a good point, Richard. He did go up to the right hand of God to open the way for us to come up to him and, and to be in that place. And, and that's, this, that's the picture of Moses going up to Sinai to get away from the work and get present with God. He asked God, who are you? He says, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. It cannot be stressed enough what God gives to Moses about himself in these verses. To use a modern term. God self-identifies. God self-identifies as the I am or the ever-existent one. That's how he self-identified, the I am or the ever-existent one. But God doesn't just identify as the ever-existent one. He also tells Moses he is the Lord God. That's Yahweh Elohim. So the work of revelation secures grace. Elohim is the head controls grace, mighty works, or works mighty. The head which controls grace works mighty. So Yahweh Elohim, the whole thing, the name that he tells him, Moses, this is me. I am the I am. But then he says, I am the Lord God. Now, he is, yes, he is the ever-existent one. He is, that is the name that they knew him by in that native, in that tongue, that language. They knew him as the ever-existent one. In other words, the creator. Everybody understood this is the creator. But he also tells Moses, I am the Lord God. So the ever-existent one is the Lord God. The Lord God is, Lord, the work of revelation secures grace, God or Elohim, the plural name for God, the head controls grace mighty work, or works mighty. The head which controls grace works mighty. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are the Godhead that we find in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. That's where Elohim is used. They are the God of creation. The, re the revelation we have regarding them brings more availability for us to receive favor. More favor is not given because we have all the favor in Christ, but more favor is accessible because we understand it more. You understand what I mean by that? If I don't know how to get ice cream out of a soft serve machine, it doesn't do me any good. I'm not going to eat much ice cream. But when you understand how to, to get the ice cream out, and if you really understand how to make the ice cream cone, oh, buddy, can you be blessed. We, we went on a cruise uh, several years back, and they had these soft serve machines on, on the one deck where all the food was. And they had chocolate and vanilla on one side, and I think strawberry and chocolate on the other side. Well, everybody was going up, and they were kind of eyeballing that machine and they put the cone underneath there or a little cup underneath there and they pull the machine down and the ice cream start coming out and they'd stop right away because it looked like a lot was coming out you know and they they weren't going to be able to control it so they, they pull it down they put a little bit more down and they walk away and they have these little dabs of ice cream well i worked at stricker's grove when i was just starting in the high school and uh one of the things we had was a soft serve machine i saw how to make soft serve cones and uh, so I went up and I pulled my handle down. I filled the base of the cone up. And then I just started stacking it up, stacking it up and stacking it up. 
I walked away from there with a cone that had to be this big. I'm not kidding you. And all these mouths dropped. They were like, wow, how'd you do that? And and then later on, and this has happened to me it, several times. We've been on vacation on it on cruise boats, and I go to the ice cream machine. Kids behind me go, hey, mister, can you make me one of them? And then they get smart, and they say, Hey, hey, mister, or in some cases, kids aren't too respectful. Hey, buddy, can you show me how to make one of those like that, like you made? I say, sure. Come here, I'll show you. Once I've shown them how to tap into that soft serve, how to make that cone that big instead of this big, you know, instead of a little bitty thing on top. Yeah, I did become the most popular guy on the ship. Instead of this little dab of ice cream on top. You get this great big cone, you know? That's that's what grace is about. It isn't that there is more ice cream in the machine because there isn't more ice cream in the machine. There isn't more grace in the machine for us. But our ability to withdraw it for ourselves is important. It is very important. Our ability to withdraw that for ourselves is ex extremely important. Important. Yes, Richard, because his supply is infinite. The only thing that is not infinite is our ability to tap the infinite. So we have to have this revelation regarding God's grace. When we understand how to tap that, it offers us more ability in us. Yeah, Richard ex rightly said our cones are too small. They just are. They're too small. And we don't know how to stack up. What's he say? Press down, shaking together, running over, right? Press down, shaking together, running over. More favor is not given because we have all of the favor in Christ. We've got it all. Just we have to understand how to tap into it. If we have a better concept of how much my parents love me, if I have that a, a better concept of that, then my actions open more grace opportunities for me. It's just the way it works. Now, part of that is knowing the Lord's name, understanding how this fits together. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. Listen what he says. This is my name forever. You notice that? The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Before that, he said, I am that I am. I am the Lord God. Later on, when Moses asked him in, in the book of Exodus, uh, I think it's Exodus 33. He says, who are you? Tell me your name. God says, I am the Lord, the Lord God, mighty and merciful. And then he gives him this big description of who he is. Gracious, long-suffering. God's name is not just a name. God's name is a complete description of him. It is a description of his character, it is a description of his power, it is a description of his authority. It is, a, it is a complete description of everything that he is. He says, the Lord God of your father Abraham, or Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. His name forever is the Lord God. yud heh vav -He Elohim. And this is my memorial to all generations. The memorial that he's saying here, this memorial that he wants us to receive, it's his name being given to them. Because God had never explained himself this way to mankind before. He had never taken, even with Abraham, to tell him, to explain to him who he was in this manner. It is a name above every name that is named. No other God can claim the power associated with the plurality of the full name of Yahweh. No God. All the gods of Egypt that Moses knew. Moses knew of Ra, the sun god. He knew of all, uh, Osiris, all these other gods. 
He knew of them. He knew the Egyptians worshipped them. He knew they made sacrifices to them. He knew they offered incense and, and coins to them. He knew that. And then here comes God saying, I'm the God that's above every, every single one of them. Every single one of them. Now, go and gather the elders of Israel together. And say to them, the Lord God of your father is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of, Jacob, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said that I will bring you up of the, out of the affliction of, the, of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will hear your voice. And you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. There it is again, the Lord, the yud our Elohim. Now, I want to go back because I, I want you to see this this thing about the name. So I, I want you um, I, I want you to understand this in, in a in a way. Well, let me let me go forward first. The message God gives to Moses isn't one of judgment or conviction, it is one of rescue by power, goodness, and mercy. This has always been God's MO. No matter how you want to look at God, God has always rescued with power, with goodness, and with mercy. God doesn't come in and slap people around and tell them how bad they've done and say, well, I guess I'll bail you out of this one. God is not in the bailouts. God is in the rescues. Rescues com come without conviction. He doesn't save by fear, but by love. The message that Moses has is one of goodness and not of judgment. Moses is to use the name of God to speak to the Egyptians. This is a clear power that God has over all their gods. When he comes in and he's going to tell, that's the reason why God said, go tell Pharaoh, the Lord God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to recognize that because he's going to recognize that when he says the Lord God, the Lord Elohim, he's going to recognize that we're talking about the creator here, the I am. He's going to recognize that because now Moses has asserted a much higher authority than Pharaoh ever knew. Pharaoh knows about all the other gods. He knows what they have and haven't done. He knows what their power is and what their power isn't. Here comes Moses. I'm going to insert and assert over you a God more powerful than any you've ever seen. And then he's going to say, let my people go. Look at Psalm 106, 7 and 8. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. Because of the name of God, because of the name of God, in reality, everything his name means implies and understands his full character, Israel is delivered. Because of the name of God, because of that name of God, because he is I am that I am, the yud heh vav -He Elohim. Because he is that, that name that he is, it implies and understands his entirety of his, his full character of who he is. Because of that, Israel gets delivered. At the name of Jesus, every tongue is made silent. It is in the name of Jesus that we're saved. But the name is not Jesus, which has the power, but rather the fullness of the name of Messiah. Now, I want you to get that, because we're going to go back to those verses I mentioned earlier, because I want you to see how these fit in. Moses here is, is understanding something that we have today. 
we have to have an understanding of today. We talk a lot about the name Jesus. But I want you to understand the name of Jesus versus the name Jesus. Look at Ephesians 1, 17 through 21. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is Paul's prayer for, for believers, specifically for the Ephesians. One of the things he says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, you notice he doesn't say that the God of Jesus Christ, or the God of Jesus. He specifically says, the God of our Lord, Yudhe Jesus Christ. The God of our, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul here is praying for the believers, and he's saying, I want you to have two things. One, I want you to have wisdom. Well, what is wisdom? Wisdom is beyond having knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, is what the, the scriptures tell us. It's beyond having knowledge. It's knowing how to correctly apply knowledge. The correct application of knowledge is wisdom. Understanding is when you know how once you've applied that knowledge, once you use wisdom, how is that going to affect everything else that it, the wisdom was applied to? That's understanding. He says he wants the God, the Father of glory, to give you the spirit of wisdom. He wants you to understand. He wants you to have wisdom. He wants you to have the knowledge, but not just have the knowledge, know how to apply the knowledge. Yeah, he never does confuse God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good point, Richard. He always does call God the Father, and he always calls Jesus the Lord. Then he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. In other words, you can see how the knowledge of Jesus correctly applied, you can see how that's going to affect everything. But he doesn't say just wisdom. He says, wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So when you get knowledge of Jesus, revelation happens. Revelation happens. New understanding or new, uh, a new vision, a new way that you see things. Revelation means to see, to see clearly or to uncover, to rip the, the cover off of something. Previously it was hit, you're going to get revelation. You're going to reveal it so that you can see it. He wants us to have revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints? That's us, those heirs. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? This revelation and wisdom are special insight into who, in full character, Jesus is as Messiah. That's what this is. It's in full character of who Jesus is as Messiah, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So Jesus, when he gets seated at the right hand of God, he assumes a name that is above every name. Well, we already know that the name of God that created everything, everything, has already been established. And God already said, this is my name forever. So we can't just be focused on the name Jesus. We have to be focused on what is that name? Not just the name, not just it's a name. Paul doesn't just refer to Jesus, but titles him Lord Jesus Christ. That is in Hebrew, Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah. Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah. Yeshua literally means Yahweh saves. 
Messiah is Mishiach, which is the anointed one. The children of Israel understood that Mishiach would be the one anointed to take them into the promised possession and deliver them from the curse of the law. They were all looking for Mishiach. Messiah. So when we start thinking about Jesus, we got to not think about Jesus, the name of a man. We have to think about the Lord Jesus the Christ. Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah. Yahweh. Yut He Bav He. The work of revelation secures grace. Yeshua, Yahweh saves. Messiah, the anointed one. Now, let's go back because I, I want to take you back to these verses that I just covered here a few minutes ago because they fit in, and I'll show you how they how they cover here. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name, notice the of, in the name of the Lord Jesus. This doesn't say in the name Jesus. If Paul meant the name Jesus, he would have said the name Jesus. But he doesn't say that. You've heard that um, that saying, the devil's in the details. Betty is a detail person. She picks up on stuff. I mean, I stuff goes whizzing by me, and I don't see it. And she'll, she'll find little minute detailed stuff. Because in the details is where you find God. In the details is where you, revelation opens, is in the details of the scripture. You always see this expressed by Paul, the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. The of is very important here because you're, just, you're not justified in the name Jesus. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, what is the name of the Lord Jesus? God says, this is my name forever to Moses. Who? The Lord God. The yud he bav -He. Yeah. The I am that I am, the Lord God. The yud he bav -He. Elohim. Yeah, you're exactly right, Richard. God never refers to, to Jesus without calling him the Lord. And there's a reason for that. There's a big difference between some guy named Jesus and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1.12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Not, not the name Jesus may be glorified in you, but the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? The name of our Lord Jesus Christ is the, is the full import of everything that God is. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not just the, a name Jesus, and so that name becomes, becomes a magical name that we can sprinkle over everything and say, well, see, we, just, we spoke the name of Jesus, or we spoke the name Jesus over that, it has to happen. No, no, no. You're not, you're not even saved in the name Jesus. You're saved in the name of Jesus. So what is the name of Jesus? If Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, right? Isn't that what Scripture teaches us? Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Well, if Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, he has to be Elohim. He has to be Elohim. Because he has to be, that is the fullness of the Godhead. Only it's bodily. He has to be the yud he vav -He. he has to be, all of those things have to be him. Not that he is the Father and he is the Holy Ghost. 
we're not talking about oneness doctrine here, but we are talking about that he is everything that the Godhead is, is Jesus. Look at 1 John. John uses the same expression, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. You guys see that? Yeah, exactly. So a man has become God. He emptied out his humanity and is taken on as the risen Christ. His name, earthly name, happens to be Jesus. But his name isn't Jesus. It is Jesus the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, exactly. I'm, I'm telling you, man, this, this is deep when you start thinking about, man, I said the name Jesus to that, and it just didn't flinch. Well, it's because there was nothing behind that. That's why God, listen, God is merciful to us. He, he blesses our ignorance so often. That's why when I say Paul prayed that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that we might know what is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of his love for us. Well, listen, it's all encompassed in who Jesus is. It's all encompassed in who he is. And you cannot separate who he is with just a name. You have to take who he is in the totality of everything that his name is. Take a look here. Let me get back to my verses. I, I started on a rambling here. Think about this as you go forward. Moses is going. He's going to Pharaoh, and, and God's giving him instruction here. And think about what he's saying is going to happen because of the name that he just spoke. Now, I just read you out of Psalm 106. Everything that God did for the children of Israel, he did because of his own name. He did that because of what his name said. His name, the children of Israel took on themselves. The children of Israel took on the, the name of God as their God. They believed that, even though they were out there in the weeds somewhere, right? They still believed that. They still had that, that this is God. Even though they're in bondage in Egypt, they're, they're, they got all kinds of things going on there with the Egyptian gods. Even though because of all that, they were still knowing he is God. He's still their God. So when they go to Pharaoh in this name, God is going to present himself to Pharaoh to make assurance of his own name. Get this? Follow, follow along on this. This becomes very important when we're told that when Jesus tells us, hey, you haven't asked anything in my name. You, Jesus told his disciples, he said, up till now, you haven't asked anything in my name. But when I go to my father, you're going to come to him and you're going to ask different because you're going to understand different. You're not going to understand just asking like it's me. You're going to understand you're asking in all who I am. But I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even with a, by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptian, strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, I, they will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go out empty-handed. Oh, buddy. Think about that as we believers. We don't need to go anywhere. We don't need to go out empty-handed. We need to go out with our hands full. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians." They're not going and taking it. They're not, they're not pulling out swords, robbing the Egyptian. None of that.
They're going to them and they're simply asking. That's all. They're just asking. But they're going to ask in the name of the Lord God, the I Am, the mighty and merciful one, he who's gracious to a thousand generations. They're going to go and ask in that name. The Egyptians know the power of the name of a God. Only in this case, it is the God of all creation. And he's going to prove himself. Acts 2, 46 and 47. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We have seen verse after verse where God favors his people. This verse should tell us that at the beginning of the church, Christians had favor with men. Why is it, or what is it, that we've lost in today's church? I mean, I, I know persecutions. Yes, listen, they're going to come. Scripture's prophesied. Persecutions are going to come. Because the world has evil in it. Because the God of this world has not been taken out yet. The prince of the power of the air, he's still, he's still roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But what should the church really expect? If the church understood, as these Egyptians that were about ready to leave Egypt, if we understood like they understood, the power of God, the majesty of God, the authority of God, the word of God, the graciousness of God, the favor of God. If they understood that like that, like these, like these uh, people, the children of Israel understood before they left Egypt, where would, where would church be today? Where would you be today? If you really understood, how would, your, how would you expect differently if you really believed who it was you were talking about? How would your expectation change? I'm telling you, I, I've learned some lessons um, about all this, to, to take a look and see how, how it is with God. Because I thought a lot, oh, well, if I'm worthy, if I, I mean, I'm Moses in, in these cases, you know, what, who am I? What do I have? Okay, God, well, wait a minute. You're going to tell me who you are? You haven't told anybody else who you are in the detail that you gave us in Jesus Christ. Think about that. The detail that God showed us in his own son of who he is. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I don't do anything. This is what Jesus said. I don't do anything except for what I see my Father do. I don't say anything except for what my Father tells me to say. So what can we believe from that? What do we believe from that? There's only one thing we can believe, right? Only one thing we can understand. Jesus and the Father are one. It, one in thought, one in methodology, one in purpose. That they are one in their understanding of, of everything. Here's Jesus. He leaves home, the home of Mary and Joseph. He's going to go out and he's going to start his ministry. 30 years old. But he's no longer Jesus, the carpenter's son. Now he is Jesus Mishak, Jesus the Messiah. The one Israel's been waiting for. The one whose name is above every name that is named. The one whose name the Hebrews were afraid to even say. So, and they, they, could, they wouldn't write it. So they, even today, people who were steeped in, in Hebrew, uh, like reading Hebrew scriptures, books on Hebrewism and everything else, they, they, instead of writing God, they will put G space D. 
is that we don't know what that is because they can't say it because it's too holy. God never intended that, by the way. But here's Jesus, and he's going to take on the entire character of who his father is. But then he gives it to the church. And it says in Acts 2, the Lord added to the church daily, daily, such as were being saved. He added to, to us daily. Take a look here at Exodus 4. This is where Moses is questioning God. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in, in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what to do, so he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. Here we see the only mention of Moses being in the priestly line of the Levites. You see that? Is not Aaron the the Levite, your brother. Well, if Aaron is a Levite, then Moses is a Levite. If their brothers are both Levites, right? So Moses is in the priestly line of the Levites. Just one more type of Christ as a priest. But Jesus isn't in the Levitical priesthood. We also see that he calls upon Aaron, and the words of Moses were put in Aaron's mouth. Aaron is a type of the church. The words of Jesus are put into the mouth of the church. Like Aaron, we get lost in many different ways in our course, but God always spares us. You notice that? God spared Aaron. He did. Over and over and over, he spared Aaron. And Aaron, I mean, Aaron was a mess up in a lot of ways. How many of us have been Aaron who came up with our own way of spirituality when God took too long to bring us an answer? You know? Moses is up on the mountain. We, we've asked him for certain things. Moses is up on the mountain. takes too long. God doesn't send him back, right? So what do we do? Uh, let's get some gold together, and uh, we'll just throw it in the fire, right? And what does Aaron say about that? Moses, I don't know what happened. The people brought me all this gold. I just threw it into the fire, and out came a golden calf. But how many golden calves have we created in our lives? Not meaning to. They just kind of happened. Because we were waiting on God and we decided we couldn't wait any longer. This is why we really have to learn how to wait on the Lord. Aaron is the guy who doesn't wait. Moses is the guy who waits. Take a look at Hebrews 11 through 14. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that an other, another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood must, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things were spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Moses was in the Levitical line. Moses spoke of the Levitical priesthood. He didn't know anything about the Judah priesthood. Judah, by the way, means praise. The priesthood of the believer, fortunately for us, does not follow that of the Arianic priesthood. We follow instead the priesthood of the tribe of Judah. Of this priesthood, Moses doesn't speak a thing about. Though we may act according in the order of or according to the Arianic tribe, we may do some things that the Levitical priesthood did, like go to the law, go to the law, and go to the law. But we're not, of that, we're not of that order. We're from the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of, of praise. We have a higher calling and a, and a higher following uh, to follow the great high priest 
who comes after the similitude of Melchizedek. From this order, we're called to be priests and kings unto our God. We're not called after the Levites to be priests and kings. We're called after Melchizedek, our great high priest. That's how we're called. But we're called according to the name that is given to that order. And it is at the name of Messiah. Messiah, the anointed one. The anointed one is the one who comes after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus became our great high priest, is what is talked about in Hebrews. When he became our great high priest and he gave a priesthood to the believers, he did not give them a priesthood after the name of Aaron and the Levitical priest. So we can't follow that order. We have to follow after the name of the priesthood given to Jesus. The name of that priesthood comes out of Judah, out of praise, comes the name of that priesthood because it is all about exalting to glory the name of the Lord God, the I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, He who was from the beginning and will be until the end. We cannot. Oh, Nancy, did you lose our, you, you lost our sound. We cannot. Yeah, that's a good point, Ed. Ed says, God inhabits our praise. It says he inhabits the praises of his people. He doesn't inhabit the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. After the Levitical priesthood comes the law. After the Judah priesthood, the priesthood that Melchizedek is the, the, the forerunner of, after that priesthood comes grace. Levi brings the law. Judah brings grace. That's how we understand. That's how we get when we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we declare the, the promises of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we talk about it, when we think about it, we, we don't think after the name of a man named Jesus. We think after the total personification of a man who came with the entire personification of who God is to become our great high priest forever in the heavenlies, making intercession for us that we might be according to that order of priesthood, the tribe of Judah. I hope you got something out of that. There's a good bit of revelation and understanding all the places where it says name of Jesus, name of Jesus, not talking about the name Jesus, talking about the name of who is Jesus. Understanding who he is and to the totality of his person is what changes our life, changes our prayer. It changes everything about us. Because now we understand really who we are, because we are born after that name. Amen. Listen, you all have a great night. I hope you got something out of this. I hope your prayer life changes. I hope the way you see yourself changes. And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Amen. Listen, have a great week. Blessings to all.